Genesis chapters 6 through 9. Now in verse 32 of chapter 5, the character Noah is introduced. The next few chapters that we're going to be studying tonight are going to relate to this man Noah. And in verse 32 of chapter 5, in reference to Noah, it says Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So when we go into chapter 6, beginning with verse 1, now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. So we began right away with an interesting controversy. Who were these sons of God? Who were the daughters of men? There are two basic views. First view would be that the sons of God were the godly line coming out of Seth, the godly line that intermarried with the ungodly line that came from Cain. And there are many men who believe that that is the proper interpretation of this, and I was taught that particular interpretation in Bible college at Biola. There is another view, though, and that view is that the sons of God were angels who took upon themselves human form and intercoursed physically with women and produced an ungodly line that were judged at the flood. I really don't have a preference to either view. I believe that there are pros and cons to both of them. I believe that the result, though, of this particular intermarriage was an ungodly offspring, an ungodly offspring that required judgment from God. And that's the real issue here that we're dealing with in chapter 6 at the beginning. It says, It came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the son of God, sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Part of the strength of the argument that it is angelic beings who have taken upon themselves human form is the fact that in verse 2 it says that they took wives for themselves. In the Hebrew, that's a very strong uh, phrase. What that literally means is they forced women unto themselves. They took them unto themselves. They forced them. You see, the word wife doesn't have to be translated wife. It can also be tra translated just woman. And when it says took, that's a forceful word. And so this gives strength to the belief that perhaps these were angels who took unto themselves these women because they saw them to be beautiful and it would give reason uh, and I believe that there are many many godly men who believe that and with good reason believe that they were angels indeed we know that in cases of demon possession there are very many instances if you were to study it um, at all from from reputable sources none of these thrill a minute books you know that come out you know <laughs> you know there, there's always somebody who will write a thrill a minute book about demons because we're so interested in them I'm talking about reputable sources. If you look into uh, something where a man has a real reputation of being a scholar in the Word of God and somebody who's not given to emotionalism or that which is the common trend in the time that he's writing, I think you can find that there are many instances recorded where uh, young ladies who have been demon-possessed have spoken of having sexual encounters with demons. There's a, a well-documented well -documented case that took place in the Philippines in the early 50s that even Life magazine was involved with. Uh, where there was a young Filipina girl by the name of Clarita who was uh, demon-possessed, and a man by the name of Lester Sumrall uh, went down there and dealt with this particular case of demon possession. And part of her testimony when she was delivered was that these demons were actually having sexual intercourse with her. Clarita was a prostitute. And uh, you, can, you can look and see that there's a very distinct possibility that this can occur and that there are impure demons who can have physical relations with women. The result, though, of this is 
that God makes a statement. In verse 3, he says, The Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. That word strive is a Hebrew word that means bear up with or bear with. In other words, I can't take this much more. My spirit shall not bear with man forever or strive with man forever. For he is indeed flesh. He's carnal. He's sold out into sin. He doesn't desire the ways of the Lord. This man is sold out to do his own thing. And I'm not going to bear with him much longer. As a matter of fact, God says his days shall be 120 years. And God gives mankind 120 years space. Now in this time, Noah is about 480 years old. You see in verse 32, the reason I turned you there is note that he was 500 when he had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. He's approximately 480 years old in the, in the writing of this particular passage here. And I believe that God gave mankind 120 years space to repent because we're told that Noah was a preacher of righteousness and that he built an ark. And that ark was a, a visible demonstration of judgment coming on to mankind. I mean, we'll get into some detail in a minute, but as an introduction... He was building an ark, which is a chest, incidentally. It isn't built like a boat, like some of the pictures you've seen, but it's a chest, and I'll describe that when we get to the description of the ark. He's building this thing in the middle of, of land that has never had rain. The Bible has said that mist had watered the ground. There was no rain. For 120 years, there he is, beaten on this ark. And his friends and neighbors are walking by, and they're seeing this man in the middle of nowhere building this gigantic ark, and they're laughing at him. But it's a visible testimony to judgment. Judgment is something that the world does not comprehend. I taught on the tribulation today. The world laugh, will laugh at the concept of a tribulation. They laugh at it. Oh, yeah, sure, God is really going to judge the earth. He's been saying that for thousands of years, and he hasn't done it yet. And they scoff. They were scoffing in the time of Noah. Noah says it's going to rain. They say, what's rain? Well, it's judgment. Well, what's judgment? And they're not really open to what God is going to do, but Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and I'm certain that he made it plain that God was bringing judgment. And unfortunately, the only people who were saved was his family. He goes on and says in verse 4, There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. And these mighty men were evil offspring, because you see in verse 5, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, God had been seeing everything up to this point and saying it's good. Remember his recording in, in Genesis 1. He saw and it was good. Now he sees that it's evil. He sees that the, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And this is the result of our human nature. There's absolutely no way a human being thinks good thoughts. I don't care who tells you that you do. I don't care who tells you that a child is perfect when they're born and they're corrupted through their environment. It's a lie. Because the Bible says that the thoughts of our heart are wicked continually. There is no good thing in me. That's what uh, Paul said. He said that in my flesh there dwells no good thing. That's why we need a Savior. He said, oh, miserable Miserable man that I am, a oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of flesh? Because he recognized that he was carnal, sold unto sin. So there are those who would say, but you're not a sinner, and they attempt to psychologize you, counsel you, out of problems. And the problem is this, is that a counselor will take you in the point of where you're at, and you will say, I feel miserable. You've got an ideal and real self. What the counselor tries to do is he tries to bring you down to what he would consider to be a normal expectation for you. Your ideal is much too high. You should be more real. It's okay if you want to drink once in a while. It's all right if you want to go out on your wife or out on your husband. Hey, if you want to buy that pornography, it's cool. It's no problem. Don't be judging yourself so harsh. You've got to loosen up a little bit. Be normal. That's what the counselor tells you. The Christian says, yes, you desire. You desire to be that because that's what God intended you to be. And it's the conscience that God has given to you that is screaming out against your sin nature, crying out for redemption. Do you want to live a life that's pure? Jesus Christ can give you that life. 
So a Christian will take it from the opposite direction. The person of the world who's trying to bring you to health mentally will bring you down. The Christian will give you hope to be elevated to where you want to be. Only the Holy Ghost can give you the power to be that whole person. I don't care how much counseling you get. I don't care. The thoughts and the intents of the heart of man, according to the word of God, is only evil continually. It's our sin nature. There's nothing we can do about it other than believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and he'll forgive you of your sin and give to you a new nature. That's redemption. So God looks and he sees that man's intent and thoughts of his heart are only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. He's sorry because of the behavior of man. And he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I'm sorry that I have made them. Now verse 8 is an interesting verse, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. Enoch had walked with God, and he was taken. Noah walked with God. I want you to notice something, what grace will do for a man. Look at this. This is an indication that without grace, you're lost, but with grace, you're justified, and you can walk with God. I want you to notice that. It's very subtle. Noah first found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So there's your first mention of grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And here's the result of grace. Noah was a just man, or he was a man made righteous by the grace God had given to him. He was a just man. And as a result of his justification, he was perfect in his generation, or he was wholehearted. That's what that word perfect means. He was wholehearted amongst his contemporaries. He was the only individual walking in grace. And as the result of him walking in grace amongst man, he demonstrated a heart that was desirous of serving God. That's what grace will do for you. It will justify you, and it will give you the desire to serve God. And then as a result of that, it says Noah walked with God, because he walked in the locative sphere of grace. He had a relationship with God due to the grace of God, due to the justification of God, due to the fact that God gave him the power to walk with him, and as a, as, as a result of that, he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, or in a state of destruction before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms or compartments or nests, literally, in the ark, and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, which would be about 450 feet now. Its width will be 50 cubits, which is about 75 feet wide. And its height, 30 cubits, which would be about 45 feet high. That's a large ark, isn't it? You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubit from above. Set the door of the ark in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Behold, I myself am bringing the flood of waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life, and everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. The ark. The ark was a box. It was a chest. Literally, that's what that word ark means. It was a chest. It was a chest that was uh, 450 feet. Now, this is only if you use what was the basic Hebrew uh, measurement of 18 inches per cubit. See, the lowest estimate would be 17.5 inches per cubit. 18 was the average. And so we figure it out at the cubit as being about 18, 18 inches. So we can approximate that. And we can say it was approximately 450 feet long, which is a football and a half long, field, a football field and a half long, a football and that would be kind of small, <laughs> football field and a half long, and about 75 feet wide and 45 feet tall. It was a square box. 
Now, there have been scientists who have checked this out, and they have realized that if you were to use those measurements, something like that could be tipped to a 90-degree angle and not tip over. It could remain st stable. Now, we know that God kept it stable anyway, but just through scientific computation, there has been discovered that you could, uh, according to those dimensions, in its displacement in water, it can be lifted up to a 90-degree angle without tipping its contents over or flipping over. So that would mean that it could handle very large waves. Now, the cubic tonnage of that is incredible. It could have, have uh, over 1,400,000 cubic feet of goods, 1,400,000 cubic feet minimally. That means you had space in this thing for 125,000 sheep. That kind of gives you an idea how big it is. As a matter of fact, one of the largest ships that ever was built was a ship that uh, was 680 feet long, and the ark, according to its dimensions, could have held over one-third more uh, uh, materials than the largest ship that man's built up to that time, which was 680 feet long. That's a pretty big ship. The ark was much bigger. And so it could hold the contents of 522 railroad boxcars. This is only, I'm only giving you this just to tell you how big that thing was. I mean, it's, you know, people say, well, how big was the ark? Oh, really? It could hold all those animals? Sure. Well, this thing was enormous. And what it was taken was the specific parents of all the offspring. So it was taking a dog, but it wasn't necessarily taking two of every kind of dogs there are. It was taking two dogs and two cattle, two horses. You know, not all the different kinds of horses, but two of each, which from those original parents sprang out all the very varieties that we have now. So this was an incredibly large boat. It didn't have any rudder. It didn't have any mechanisms for steering. It was built just to hold cargo. The cargo was all the living animals that breathed. It had a window on the top of it that would let air in, and you surely would need that. <laughs> with all those animals. And it was enormous. And God made the statement in verse 17, I myself am bringing the flood of waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which the breath of life is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. Now, in every major civilization, there are uh, stories of the flood. The Chaldeans or the Babylonians have their myths of the flood. The Phoenicians, the Phrygians, the Syrians, Persians, Indians, Cherokees. Mexicans, uh, the Fijians from the Fiji Islands, and the Greeks all have stories of the flood. Now, there are those who would say that it was a local event. I do not believe it was a local event. It was an event that took place over the entire world. And we'll see this in a minute. But it took place in, over the entire world. There are those who would argue very vehemently that it was a local flood. If it were but a local flood, why then would you need all the animals to be placed in it, in that ark? And why not? Why, why, would, why didn't God just say, you know what, Noah, I'm going to flood this valley here. So what I want you to do is take your friends and move over that mountain while I wipe out this valley. God didn't say that. God said he's going to wipe everything out. He said, behold, I myself am bringing the flood of waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. And everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come to you. Notice that will come to you. Noah didn't go out looking for the animals. They came to Noah. You know, you see these movies of Noah walking out like this little, little pipe, you know, and all these animals falling. In the Bible, I think they have that. You know, you see Noah walking, blowing this little pipe, and all these animals falling out. That's crazy. What it was, was God brought them to him. And you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. And the obedience of Noah, we will see, is resulting in his salvation. God spoke to him and said, I'm going to bring something upon the earth that no man has ever seen. I'm going to bring a flood and I'm going to wipe out everything. But I want you to build this gigantic chest. And in that chest, I want you to put a door and I want you to put a window. I want you to make it uh, with three levels. 
and I'm going to bring all these animals to you because I'm going to open up the floodgates of heaven and I'm going to wipe out mankind. You don't see Noah arguing about it. So, well, you know, what is water, Lord? I mean, coming from the sky, you know, you don't see an indication. What you see is obedience, and the obedience of Noah resulted in the salvation of Noah and his family. Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Now you shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of the earth. For after seven more days I will cause it to rain on the earth, forty days and forty nights, and I'll destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. So he brought two of the unclean animals and seven of the clean. The reason he brought seven of the clean is he kept one for a sacrifice that he's going to make once he lands on dry earth. Now imagine what it would have been like to be the seventh animal that was clean. Now you look to your side and there are three pair of doves, but you're the only dove without your wife. And you start wondering, why is this? It's because you're going to be sacrificed at the end of the trip. Isn't that nice? <laughs> God said, for after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days. 40 days is typical of judgment. On the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I've made. Noah did according to all the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was on the earth. So Noah, with his sons, his wife and his sons' wives, went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of clean beasts, of beasts that are unclean, of birds and of everything that creeps on the earth, two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. You see, as I was explaining to you in the beginning of um, creation, God had separated the waters underneath from the waters above. There was a gigantic water belt that at one time surrounded the earth, and it was a belt that had created a greenhouse effect over the earth that shielded the earth from radiation, cosmic rays, which caused the longevity to be possible for mankind to live long lives. It created a perfect environment with no windstorms or dust storms, perfect environment completely because of this water belt. But what God did is he just perforated that water belt and let that water fall upon the earth. And it completely covered the earth with water. There were waters underneath that were broken open and came spurting up to the top. The windows of heaven were opened and it poured down and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, of all flesh in which is the breath of life. Now, God didn't wipe out all the fish unless they got wiped out in the turbulence, but specifically was uh, dealing with those that breathed air. So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. And I've shared this before on Bible studies. God shut him in. The ark is typical of Jesus Christ and how there is only one door in the side of that ark to enter into safety. And Noah and his family entered into the safety and protection of God by entering into that one door. There weren't several doors for him to go in. Well, I'd rather climb at the top or I'd, I'd rather go on on the back. There was one door. God said, make one door. And there was but one door for him to enter into safety and protection and salvation. It's a type of salvation in Jesus Christ today. There aren't many ways to God. There's one way, one door. It's the door of Jesus. He called himself the door, and we enter in through him. And as I look at this, I also think to myself, what would it have been like to have been Noah? Why is it necessary that God should have shut him in? I believe because Noah could very well have been tempted to open the door up had he control over it. How would you have felt if your friends and neighbors 
were clawing at that door, screaming. And you could hear the babies crying and the terror of the people realizing that judgment indeed has come and they were too late. I believe that in human weakness, without God's sight, I would have opened that door and let sin in to the ark. Let sin that had been preached to for 120 years, the righteousness of God and his judgment, I think I would have allowed it back into the ark. God knows better, and God closed the door. And I can imagine Noah with his hands over his ears, hearing the screams and the cries of people as they're clambering upon each other, trying to open that door, forcing it open, and it would not open because God shut him in. This is what motivates us to preach the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ now because judgment is coming. The word of God teaches that. And there will be a day when that rapture occurs, when people will run to those churches that they had heard all those messages in and find them empty, except for the unbelievers who used to sit and warm the pews. They'll be there, and they'll be crying, and they'll say, we lost out. This is why it's so important to find Christ now. Now the flood was on the earth 40 days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed. In other words, they were overwhelmingly mighty and greatly increased or rapidly increased on the earth. And the ark moved about the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth. And all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed 15 cubits upward and the mountains were covered. The highest mountain that we have is Mount Everest, it's 29,028 feet in elevation. Dan and I looked that up to make sure that that statistic was correct before I gave it to you. 29,028 feet high. Do you know that they have found in the Himalayas fossils 27,000 feet up? 27,000 feet up. They have found fossilized remnants. The waters of the flood rose to be 22 and a half feet higher than the top of even Mount Everest. That's a pretty deep local flood. <laughs> and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man, all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. They leveled off at about the, at the highest level for, at about the 150th day. You know, we're going to see Noah in an ark about 371 days. That's how long he was in that ark, 371 days estimated must have been an incredible experience for him to be in there. All those animals, all that smell, you know? I wonder what it would have been like. I'm certain he must have had a room up by the window. <laughs> it is possible that the uh, animals were in a hibernation for that year, though, and it's very likely that they were. Now in, verse, in chapter 8, it says, Then God remembered Noah. And it's not as if God had forgotten him. You know, like, oh, I got Noah in the boat. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's a, what is called a Hebraism. It means that God at that time began to act on their behalf. That's what it means when he says that God remembered him. He began to act on their behalf. And every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, were also stopped. And the rain from heaven was restrained. The waters receded continually from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the water decreased. Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month on the mountains of Ararat. 
Now, Ararat's highest elevation is 17,000 feet, and it, it ranges from 12,000 to 17,000 feet. There are a lot of books uh, in search of Noah's Ark. There are a lot of books written about that. Recently, perhaps you were reading in your newspaper of some explorers who just returned. This is in, in uh, the land of Turkey now. And uh, some explorers who just returned who said that they have found the Ark. There have been many sightings and many reportings over the years. There has been little or no factual evidence ever presented. For the longest time, the Turkish government didn't want excavations or any archaeological uh, uh, digs taking place in that area. And just recently, they've begun to allow a little bit. But there isn't really that much. And I was reading in the newspaper within uh, three weeks ago that uh, some people had just returned and said that they had located it and that they were going to attempt to bring some evidence out. We'll see whether or not that takes place. But anyway, it says that it rested on uh, the mountains of Ararat. The waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So it came to pass at the end of 40 days, or 40 more days, or 40 days later, that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Then he sent out a raven which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. Now a raven is a scavenger, and a raven doesn't need to return to the boat. So all that raven did is all this debris, it could rest on it, and all the dead animals that were floating, it would eat of it. And so the raven went out, and he just kept flying back and forth over the waters, and he stayed out. But he also sent out from himself a dove to see if the waters had abated from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, and she returned into the ark to him, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. He waited yet another seven days. And again he sent the dove out from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And no one knew that the waters had abated from the earth. And what no one knew was that some olive tree seedlings were now taking root and were beginning to blossom. And this little dove had landed and had picked up one of those uh, evidences that that life was returning to the earth and returned to the boat with it and that's what Noah sees here so he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove which did not return again to him anymore so he knew that it was dry it came to pass in the 601st year in the first month the first day of the month that the waters were dried up from the earth and Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked and indeed the surface of the ground was dry and in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dried. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird, and whatever creeps on the earth according to their families went out of the ark. That must have been a real kind of uncanny feeling for him. Have you ever been on a boat? You know those of you who were in the Navy? When you go out to sea and you get your sea legs? And when it lands and you start walking, it's like, or have you ever jumped on a trampoline? You know, you stay there for a half hour jumping up and down. And then you climb off the trampoline, and the first step is like solid rock, and it feels so weird. And takes, you know, I can picture Noah and his whole family kind of creeping out of the ark, you know, <laughs> testing their legs, walking, and all the beasts, you know, waking up, you know, just walking around. It must have been really, really a trip. It says, Noah built an altar to the Lord. This is the first mention of an altar to God. Noah built an altar to the Lord, and he took of every clean animal, and of every clean bird, and offered bird offerings on the altar. The offerings were to uh, praise God and were uh, a consecration of himself and his family to the service of the Lord. And it says, And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. 
Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. When the Bible says the Lord smelled a soothing aroma, what that means is God accepted the sacrifice that was being presented to him. Be very careful not to give to God the attributes of a man and say God's a man. He can smell, he can see, he can hear. All the Bible does is it teaches that God has these attributes to give to you and me an understanding of his relationship with us. But don't try and clothe him as a man physically because he has no physical body in the way that you and I would imagine him. This is the chief error of Mormonism, which teaches that God has a body of flesh and bones. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible uses what is called anthropomorphisms. It uses uh, things that you and I as human beings have in order to give us an understanding of the way God deals with man. So when it says that he smelled the soothing aroma, it's not necessarily that God has a sense of smell in the way that you and I have. He has a nose and he smelled. But what it was is he was accepting that sacrifice. He received that sacrifice to himself. The Lord said in his heart just refers to the understanding of the Lord. He said in his heart, I'll never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. I believe this demonstrates the mercy of God because he knows what he's working with. He knows that you and I and every human being who has ever lived is lost in sin. God knows that. It's not a surprise to him. It's no secret to him. He knows that. But we're not to despise his mercy or his patience with us. You know, the book of Romans, I'm going to turn to it. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Makes a very clear statement in regards to this. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, which is him, him holding back judgment, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? How many times have we shaken our puny little hands in the face of God and said, if you're God, judge me? If there really is a God and God really hates sin, then why hasn't he dealt harshly with my life? Why is it that the sinners seem to have it so good and those of you who are Christians seem to have it so bad? If there really is a God, it seems to me that he's unfair to you. You're trying so hard. Hey, if God is a God of mercy, then he's a God of grace. And if grace extends to all my sins and regardless of what I do, if God can forgive it, then I'll just continue to sin. Because if through sin grace comes, then the more the sin, the more the grace. That's the argument that Paul was dealing with in the book of Romans when he said, what are we to say then? Should we sin all the more because grace may abound? God forbid. God forbid. Don't you understand that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Don't you understand he's saying to us and to the people who don't know Jesus that God hasn't judged you not because there's no God, because he loves you and he's given you a space to repent. Even as I, as an, of a, a human father, as a human father, grieve when I have to chasten my children. I give them a lot of space to repent. Maybe sometimes too much. Maybe sometimes I should respond quicker and be more abrupt when they're sinning and disobeying and lying to me the way children do. But I find myself holding back sometimes because of mercy, because I want to extend grace to them. We try and teach our children the principle of grace. My children were disobedient on one day, not that long ago. They're disobedient every day, but in this one particular time. <laughs> my children were being disobedient, and they were not deserving of any surprises. We call them surprises when we take them to get them ice cream or something. They weren't deserving of them, but their mama took them and bought them an ice cream. And my son David said, we don't deserve this ice cream. He said this yesterday. Mama, we don't deserve this ice cream because I've been disobedient today, but you're giving to me a gift, aren't you? And Mama said, yes. David's five. He's learning the concept of grace. Mama said, yes, honey, you have been disobedient, but Daddy wants to give to you a gift to show his love for you. Why is it then that we take God's grace to be so cheap when we should see it as being that which God uses to draw us to himself? If we really want judgment, then we just have to hold back because the day of judgment comes, and then we'll discover what it means to fall into the hands of the living God. And I don't want to do that. 
I'm grateful to God that he shall make me to stand in his presence because the entire creation shall fall when he says, bow down, worship me, call me Lord, because that's what I am. And so God said, even though, back in Genesis 8, even though the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, that he would destroy every living thing again as he had done. And he goes on in verse 22 and he says, Well, the earth remains seed time and harvest and cold and heat and winter and summer and day and night shall not cease. In other words, the earth will remain stable enough for man to be able to live on it again. Now, things have changed on the earth due to this flood. There are now larger oceans. There is less land. Temperatures have changed. There is no such thing as a water blanket anymore. So there's wind and rain and earthquakes and radiation pouring in, reducing man's longevity. He no longer can live to be 800, 900 years old. He's going to be reduced in his age now. Gigantic glaciers now are at our poles. Things have changed. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth, and all on all the fish of the sea, they're given into your hand. In other words, beasts will no longer be submissive to you willingly. They're going to be afraid of you. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. No longer is man just a vegetarian. He is now carnivorous. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Don't eat eating bloody, bloody meats. You're supposed to drain that, because the life of the flesh is in the blood. Surely, for your lifeblood, I will demand a reckoning from the hand of every beast, I will require it, and from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. This is the point where human government is now ordained by God. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. God introduces capital punishment. For in the image of God, he made man. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations, I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh is on, that is on the earth. So from our perspective, you see a rainbow, and it, from us, we look towards it. From God's perspective, he's looking from heavenward down, and he sees that rainbow. And that rainbow is an everlasting covenant. Whenever it rains and you look up and see that, remember the promise that God made. Certainly it rains and it produces the rainbow, but God isn't going to let it rain like it did once before. And we can look at that as his covenant promise to us. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. You'll see many times as we go through the scriptures the name Canaan. Canaan was the father of what is called the Canaanites, a very evil people. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. Today we have over 150 nations and 3,000 dialects, and they all come from the common ancestry of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. He was an agriculturalist, and he planted some grapes is what he did. He drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. Now, there's a lot of controversy in this simple passage. Did Noah know that wine fermented and would become strong drink? Or was fermentation, which is a process of decay, something that was not as rapid in the case of making grape juice as prior to him going into the ark? 
I'm really not sure. I'm not sure if he overdrank or overindulged intentionally or whether or not it was a mistake on his part. He wasn't aware of the fact that fermentation was taking place. But the result of him making this grape juice was that it fermented. And as it fermented, it became potent alcohol. And he was there just laying around in his tent all by himself. I'm sure the boys were gone with their wives. And here's Noah sitting in his tent, and he's drinking. He's drinking a little bit too much. And as alcohol has a tendency of increasing uh, sense of body temperature, he started sweating in his tent. Nobody's around. So he uncovers himself and in a drunken stupor falls asleep on one of his beds. And he's just laying there naked. He was uncovered in his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Now when it says he told his two brothers, it's a phrase that means that he came outside and he was saying, you should see the old man, he soused. It's great, check him out. It is rebellious. It is a breaking of a relationship between a son and his father. It is like Ham is finally able to make fun of the old man who's been making all these rigid rules for me to live under all this time. Check him out. He's naked in his tent, man. Guys ought to go in. He began to ridicule his father. It was a sign of his rebellion. What did Shem and Japheth do? Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away. They did not see their father's nakedness. They respected their dad. They realized that he had made a mistake or whatever, and they covered him. They weren't about to dishonor their father. And they went in and covered him up. Noah awoke from his wine, and he knew what his younger son had done to him. Now, there are those who tie in Ham and Canaan with uh, an act of homosexuality because Canaan and the Canaanites were known for homosexual practices in their religion. And they would say in verse 24, Noah woke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. They would say that what he had done was he had used his father in a sexual manner. I'm only telling you that because that is something that people teach and do believe. What I believe that happened was that Noah awoke to know his ridicule that his son had uh, done against him. He knew what had happened. And I, and, I, and I hold more to that than the other theory. He knew that, in other words, Ham had dishonored him. He said, cursed be Canaan. Now, because Noah's son had sinned, Noah now curses Ham's son, Canaan. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. But he said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Shem is the father of the Jewish nations, the Semitics. That's where they get their name from. Blessed be the God of Shem refers to the covenant relationship God is going to have with the Jews. This is a prophecy in blessing. And may Canaan be his servant. Incidentally, uh, Ham is the father of, uh, of uh, e Egyptians and the Ethiopians and the African nations, which incidentally, I must say this before I go on, I do not believe that the curse was one of dark skin and that the black races would forever be servants, though that is taught. And that I say that to you only because it's taught. That's ridiculous, and that's not what he's talking about. Absolutely no way. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth. Japheth is the father of the Caucasians, the Europeans. And may he dwell in the tents of Shem is a prophecy of the relationship that we Gentiles will have with the God of Shem, the Semitics, or the Jewish God. And we being able to enter into the blessings that God gave to Shem. This is a direct prophecy of that. And once again, may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth. May he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died.